Welcome to another moment in the Word. Are you forgiven? Forgiven of your sins? Are you confident that you're absolutely forgiven? That God has forgiven you of your sins? And how do you know? What is the basis of your forgiveness? And what did you have to do in order to be forgiven? Well, all of that is now explode, exposed for us in Leviticus in chapter 23. And we're looking at the Feast of Atonement. And it says, and on the 10th month, this is verse 27, of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement, and it shall be a holy convocation unto you. And you shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So we find that more described for us in Leviticus 16. And that's where we'll spend most of our time in actually trying to understand what is this date the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur. Well, what does Kippur mean, and what is atonement? It actually, Kippur is first found back in Genesis in chapter 6 and verse 14, where uh, Noah is told by God, make yourself an ark of gopher wood and make rooms in the ark and cover it. There's the word kafar and cover it inside and outside with pitch. In other words, it is to be smeared entirely with the tar so that water wouldn't go in or water wouldn't come out. It would preserve the wood. But it also is a picture of the covering that we have when we have acknowledged our sin. And so we find in Proverbs chapter 28, he who covers his sin, if we try to provide the covering, we will not prosper. But whosoever confesses and forsakes them shall find mercy. And so for that reason, on the day of Yom Kippur is a day, it's the 10 days of awe that are now finally consummated in this day, the most solemn of all holy days in the, for the people of Israel and for the believer. It is the most solemn day because God has forgiven us of our sin. For that reason, the book of Jonah is read in the synagogues. It is a picture of God's forgiveness. That nation of Nineveh, that great capital of the Assyrian people, that that nation was warned by God that they had but 40 days, then judgment, but they confessed, they forsook their sin, and God spared their nation for another 40 years. And God also says in Proverbs 28, verse 13, that he who confesses his sin shall find mercy. First John, he also says, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. So what do we have to do? We have to therefore confess our sin. That word that we find here is afflict, afflict your soul. What does that mean? It's the same thing. It is confessing, but it is more than mere confessing. It is also a, the word afflict is the word that's used for to press or to humble, to submit. And it has the idea of something that we do within our soul. In uh, Psalm 20, uh, 35, in verse 13, it says, I humbled my soul with fasting. So consequently, this whole period is a period of fasting. We call it the Feast of Atonement, but in reality, there's no feast. There's no food, but it is a feast. It's a feast knowing that God has supplied for our soul. And when he says afflict our soul, the word for soul is referring to myself. It's referring to all that is within me, that I am broken before the Lord because of my sin. It's very, very different than the Pharisee. You remember the Pharisee and the publican? The Pharisee who thought that by his physical fasting, he could satisfy the requirements of true self-affliction because he was depriving himself of what he wanted. But it was the praying publican who was not fasting, 
but instead has humbled himself, couldn't even look to the heavens, realizing that he was a sinner and begging for God's forgiveness. That's where this affliction of the soul is. And my dear ones, is that something that as you look at yourself and you say, I have sinned, I have fallen far short. And it is not just simply as a non-believer, but even as a Christian. Once a year, the nation of Israel came before the Lord as a consequence of these feasts. And this feast, you have the whole nation, all of the men of Israel, they come back. They come back for the Feast of the Trumpets. They stay for the next 10 days, 10 days of awe, 10 days of self-reflection, 10 days where they take a thorough inventory of their past year and where they have sinned, and then they confess it to a priest. And then the high priest is going to lay his hands on the heads of two goats. And the one goat was then taken and his blood would be sprinkled seven times on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies, and then seven times at the base. Seven times to cover the place where the Ark of the Covenant was, where we meet with God, God meets with us, and seven times to cover our sin, the ground. And then... There was the other goat. The other goat was called the Aziel. The Aziel is the scapegoat. That goat was taken by a young man for three days, taken into the wilderness, and after those three days, let go. And the young man would come back, and the goat would never be found again. God has promised that he would separate our sins as far as the east is from the west. You see, it's in this context we find this expression. It's in Isaiah 55 and verses 8 and 9 where he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as high as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's in the context of God's mercy. It's not just simply that God thinks thoughts far greater than our thoughts, and he does. It's that we oftentimes want judgment. We want justice, especially when it comes to someone else. But God has extended his mercy toward us and grace toward us. We, on our part, must humble ourselves, and the humbling is a confession. It is a repentance. It's what it says in Psalm 103 and verse 11, that is, that far as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him, that we fear God. We fear because we know his judgment, but because of that, we have confessed our sin. We've humbled our heart. We've afflicted our soul. We have said, Lord, I have sinned. And the result of that is God is merciful. He is merciful in that he has forgiven. What does the word forgiven mean? That word aziel, scapegoat, it means to let go. Luo is the word in the Greek. It means to loose. In other words, it is to let go. So what God has said, I will remember your sin no more. It's not that God has celestial amnesia and doesn't have the capacity to remember. No, he has determined not to bring it up again. If you have trouble forgiving yourself, then I suggest that, first of all, you acknowledge what Jesus did on the cross for you was to pay for the penalty of your sin and acknowledge you don't need to forgive yourself as much as to accept the forgiveness that God has given to you. And then acknowledging that is then the promise, knowing that he promises never to bring it up again. You don't bring it up again. And if you forgive another, because remember in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive another, that we promise <clears throat> never to bring it up again. We promise that we're going to let it go. And that's what that means. This is an incredible day. It's a day, a solemn day,
It is a day, however, when there's a great celebration because knowing that our sin will never be brought up again is the greatest of all gifts that God could give to us. Oh, my dear one, I pray you know the freedom from your sin. You know that Jesus died for you. This is also a picture of a prophetic event that will take place. You see the first four celebrations, the first four holy days, they were historical. We had the Feast of Passover. That was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross. There was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That was when he was buried. There was the Feast of First Fruits. That was when he arose from the grave. There was the Feast of Pentecost. That's when the Spirit of God came. And then there was a long summer. Four months have passed. And now we come to Tishri. We come to this month. And now we find the Feast of the Trumpets. The trumpet sounds. The dead in Christ rises. And then we have the beginning of the trumpets where God is calling the nation of Israel to an awareness of sin, to an awareness that Jesus is Messiah. And then there is the day Yom Kippur, the day in which Israel will say Baruch Bashem Adonai, that he is the one that they have said, blessed is he who comes in the name of of the Lord, that they will acknowledge him. And then there will be finally the Feast of Tabernacles when Jesus will then reign from Mount Zion for the thousand years and that's yet to come. I pray that if you don't know Jesus, you acknowledge him on the cross that he died for you, that you repent of your sin, acknowledge him as your Lord. If you're a Christian, Acknowledge that we continue to sin. We're no better than anyone else. But we also acknowledge that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this incredible event that comes on the Day of Atonement. The reminder to us that Jesus is our kafar. He's our covering. His blood is what covers our sin. Thank you, Father. In the holy and precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.